but yeah. There's the last of them on the flood. <clears throat> now, in my reading writings by atheists and agnostics and by even some that claim to be creationists, old earth creationists, they take a local flood view. Uh, there's a claim that the that there's evidence that there was uh, worldwide fires, and uh, does this accord? That it, is this evidence? Is it good? And I believe it is. Then does my flood model account for this for the worldwide fires? And so this lesson and the series of several lessons here will deal with that question as we look at at the uh, material tonight. So we're looking at the question about fires. Now, again, this is one of the arguments atheists make, and I don't believe the other flood models that I've read, although I believe a lot of brethren have, uh, a lot of men have written, not necessarily the brethren, but a lot of men, the denominational people, have written some good material on the flood. Uh, I believe their, their model is uh, flawed. Uh, it's, it's a it has a lot of truth in it, but it doesn't cover all the bases is the problem. Now, I believe there were post diluvian fires. Post means after diluvian is the flood. We're going to look at the evidence and possible causes of the fires, and then we'll have two or three lessons on this, maybe four. I'm not I can't remember exactly how long it's going to take me to finish this. There the Earth itself has evidence of fire of a fire having burnt almost worldwide uh, at some time in the past. And the claim is made there's three different explanations for this for this evidence. And we'll, we'll have to look at several factors. We put them all together and draw a conclusion. There's a Conclusion that volcanoes cause fires, and certainly they can do that. And uh, of course, they eject, eject burning uh, rock and molten rock and set things on fire. That certainly can happen and does happen. And there's the organic matter theory. Uh, it's very interesting that they have found that some organic matter, some organisms, uh, plants of some sort, will concentrate certain chemicals or certain metals. And uh, we're going to get one particular metal uh, element, it's an element uh, called iridium. And uh, it, it comes almost exclusively from uh, meteorites and from uh, extraterrestrial outside the Earth sources. It is in the Earth, but it's uh, not found in the surface of the Earth very much. Unless there's uh, been uh, evidence of a maybe meteorite striking, and there you, some of these plants will actually concentrate uh, this iridium. I'm I'm suspicious. I've been told that there's some plants that will concentrate gold, for example, and that gold uh, is there is gold suspended in the ocean water. And if uh, some, someone gets real smart, they may take these plants that concentrate gold and grow them in the ocean and then mine them or, or refine them and get the gold out of them. I, I think some smart enterprising person might just do that. And it's entirely possible. So if you decide and you pull off on that and do it, uh, give me one tenth of one percent of what you make, if you will. That's a joke. Organic matter material. There's the impact theory that uh, meteorites impacted the Earth and set things on fire. Now we know volcanoes can set things on fire. We know meteorites can do it. There's evidence of that. And there's evidence that uh, organic matter can concentrate iridium, particularly the iridium, and maybe even other out of the platinum group elements. There exists, however, no biblical evidence of post living fires unless it's Job 6, 15 and 16. That's a possibility. I want you to look at this passage with me, if you will, Job 6, 15 and 16. My brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook. 
as the channel of brooks that pass away, which are back by reason of the ice, black by reason of the ice that were in the snow hideth itself. I'm convinced that if that there is sufficient evidence of a worldwide fire, and it was in it's in the upper soil, and I'm convinced that it happened after the flood that the debris that was on the earth burned up. Uh, in my model, there was cosmic ice rained down at the polar region, particularly in perhaps other places. And there was a uh, ice sheet across North America and other places. And the ice sheet was very, very cold being cosmic ice. And so this, this these fires that occurred uh, they would they would uh, heat up the earth, burning the wood and the trees and other things, and they would also uh, produce soot, black soot, which would settle on the ice. And ice is uh, has a an albedo, which is a reflection ratio that would reflect almost all the light. Whenever the northern plains of the United States get snowpack on them. It gets cold because the sunlight gets reflected back out into space by the white snow. But if the snow had black soot on it, uh, it would absorb heat. The black does, a black object absorbs a lot of heat. And so that that's uh, maybe what he's talking about here, which as we see here, which are black by reason of the ice. So that the ice is black. That's what he's telling me. And this will fit my mind. Now, of course, Job is a post-Diluvian flood book. Uh, he lived 200 years or maybe longer. So he's probably a contemporary of Abraham, maybe even before Abraham. So it's possible that, that some of this snow, this ice, this ice here was covered with black soot, which would help it to melt it. The sunlight would not reflect back into space. It's called albedo, and it would not reflect back, and it would heat up the earth more quickly. Any questions or comments there? This passage, Job, I'm certainly not certain as to whether it's actually talking about the ice being black. It calls it black. If these fires occurred, the primary geologic evidence is from the sediments. And uh, where we where do we find this evidence? And it's uh, it's all in the upper sediments. I, I contend that the fires probably occurred during the time that the floodwaters had ceased to cover the earth. And we'll look at this. Before the flood, the trees grew quite large, and there was there was lush uh, environment of plants, and this organic matter. Uh, would have covered the earth in large amounts of it would have floated around and been on top of the ground. And it would take time for these these plants to break down. But and we needed and with all of the cosmic ice, the earth was extremely cold. And so what this would do then it would warm it up more quickly. A few months of burning fires would producing a black coal, uh, black soot to cover the ice and snow would indeed speed up the heating up of the earth itself. Uh, the organic matter then would, would have been consumed. Any any debris of a dead animal flying around that caused a disease to spread would be burned up as well. They would be consumed by this as well. <clears throat> dead, dead animals of all sorts would have been burned as well if, with the wood. So it would have transformed the earth to the post diluvian environment that we see today, more like what we see today. So I believe the earth has been warming up ever since the flood. <clears throat> the clay in the sediment of the KT boundary, now that's a geologist abbreviation for Cretaceous tertiary boundary, uh, and that's one of the upper boundaries contains several anomalies. Now that just means it doesn't follow the normal order. An anomaly does can be explained <coughs> by the explanation of my of my Fox flood model that we set forth in this book. 
The boundary contains much larger amounts of several elements that is normally found on the surface of the Earth. So there's several elements that are found there that are not found elsewhere in the in the, in the sediment. <coughs> you have to explain how it got there and wasn't in the lower sediment. These elements are iridium, particularly, and other elements of the same class of elements. By that I mean the platinum group elements. We won't get into the chemistry of it. These elements that we see here in this soil, this upper soil, are found in abundance in asteroids, meteorites, and comets. So they're they're out there in abundance in these in these objects, asteroids, meteorites, and the comets. The presence of iridium was discussed. We discussed that in our second chapter of this treatise. In an earlier lesson, we did. We've already discussed iridium earlier in an earlier lesson lessons we had. The iridium anomaly is usually explained by atheistic scientists in one of three ways. Let's look at those three ways tonight. And we'll look at them in some detail. First, some claim the anomaly was caused by the death of organic matter that concentrated iridium. But the problem with this is there's not iridium in the lower layers of rock in the, in the large amounts. So we don't have it in lower layers very much. Some claim that um, this anomaly was caused by the impact of an asteroid or perhaps a comet or several comets, which is claimed also called, caused fires on the global scale. And that may be closer, this may be closer to the truth as, as it fits my model better. Third, some claim this anomaly was caused by volcanic eruptions. And uh, we know we have two kinds of volcanoes that erupt, and we'll look at those. There are at least two types of volcanoes. The first type is explosive type. It blows up, and uh, it's called felsic lava. The, the rock felsic lava has a lot of silicon in it, and what it'll do, it'll solidify and plug up the vent from which the lava is flowing out. It, it cools off quickly enough and hardens plugs the vent up, then pressure builds up in it, and finally enough pressure builds up, it blows up again, it blows the top off that vent. It's been plugged up. So that's a felsic lava. That would be uh, would cause the pressure build up, of course there's an explosion. We see this Mount St. Helens in, in the northwestern United States as an example of this type of a volcano. Second type has a free flowing lava, basaltic lava, so it's a different kind. The, the chemical composition of the lava is such that it doesn't harden quickly. It remains molten until it's flowed freely from the vent for some distance. Sometimes it flows for several miles before it hardens. This type doesn't plug up the vent and cause an explosion. And we find then now, St. Helens in Washington State in the United States is an excellent example of the first type. And Kilauea in Hawaii is an excellent example of the second type of volcano. I'm using volcanoes in the United States, but there are volcanoes of this nature in other places in the world. Uh, Kilauea is, is very famous for it, but there's other bigger volcanoes than Mount St. Helens in Washington State uh, in other places in the world. Okay. We've talked about some of those. Officer and Drake discussed two of these theories, the volcanic and the impact theories. Again, pages S45 through S46 in the source that we cite in the book. Rocket and, uh, and others argue for volcanic eruptions creating uranium anomaly, pages 77 through 80. And we're not going to be looking at them in some detail. I will answer some of their claims, give my answers to them. Their reason for claiming the anomaly was of a volcanic origin is because this anomaly extends over a range of almost five meters of shale. And of course, what they do is the shale extends both above and below the KT boundary. I think the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is an artificial boundary uh, created and generated and dreamed up by. By atheistic uh, uh, uniformitarian geologist. Um, Crockett, it all assumed the shale took about 1 million years to deposit. 
based on uniformitarian assumptions. The problem with that is, if this didn't take many years, if it was deposited in a short period of time, as, as per my flood model, that would answer his arguments here for it. So he, he argues that it took that long, so that wouldn't fit. It had to be a, a repetitive uh, deposition by comets or meteorites. We'll, we'll see why the uh, iridium would have settled out of the atmosphere in just a few months after it hit from a comet or from meteorites. If these assumptions are wrong, this iridium could have come from extraterrestrial sources. Other atheists or, or agnostics are forced to accept the volcanic origin theory because they assume the shale could not have been deposited in a matter of a few days. Now, my flood model and most other flood models would have it deposited in a few days in a short period of time. Again, they have they have rejected the flood models, of course, they're atheists. If it's proven that the iridium anomaly was caused by the impact of the of a bolide, remember a bolide is an object, it's from the Greek word bolides, something thrown. And so it's like uh, an impact of a comet or uh, uh, asteroid or meteorites, the layer of shale of over four meter thickness was laid in a very short period of time and within the less than a year's time. And so we would find this as four meters. Uh, it's evident because the iridium would settle out of the atmosphere in a matter of a few weeks after the impact. That's why. And uh, it's, it's a heavy element, so it won't remain in the upper atmosphere very long. The claim that the iridium anomaly was produced by volcanism derives evidence from the wrong kind of volcano. Remember, there's two kinds of volcanoes. There's one that has, has basaltic and the one feltic. Feltic plugs up the vent and blows up and explodes. And uh, the uh, other one just free flows out like Kilauea. Now, they need an explosive volcano with feltic lava uh, to uh, get this dispersed throughout the world. And they don't have that because the only volcanoes where they can find iridium is, uh, is the uh, basaltic, the free flowing doesn't blow up and explode. Wrong kind of volcano. Iridium can be concentrated in the volatile component associated with basaltic volcanism, although they do not imply that Hawaii's style eruption represents a mode of physical volcanism appropriate to KT boundary phenomena, Crockett argues. So Crockett admits that the uh, basaltic uh, won't answer it because it's not explosive, it won't blow it and spread it over the earth. Uh, the Hawaiian style eruption in Kilauea puts massive amounts of uh, basaltic uh, lava on the surface of the earth and it, it just keep, keeps on free flowing. Sometimes it flows more than the others. Uh, actually, the mountain there is the tallest mountain in the world. If you go from the base of the mountain to the top of it, even taller than, than, than uh, the tallest mountains in the Himalayas. Why? Because it goes from the ocean floor up to up to the uh, several thousand feet above sea, above sea level. So it's a tall mountain if you go from the base of it. Lava, and it, it, that it will have uh, iridium in it, but the other ones don't. To support the theory that the iridium originated from volcanic processes, there needs to be volcanoes with felted lava, explosive volcanoes with high levels of iridium in the lava, and they haven't never they've never found one that was had high levels of iridium in it, explosive lava, felted lava. Have not been found. And there's no evidence to support the volcanic theory. Now, then the fact that they haven't found it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means they don't have any evidence to support their conclusion. That's all that means. There are several organisms that we can look at the organic matter theory now, concentrated iridium, in which would give a possible explanation for at least some of the iridium anomalies. And Dyer and all this several microorganisms that either enhance, erase, or disperse iridium. 
organism, and here's a name of a list of them, and this is a quote from Dyer. I'm not going to read all of these words, but I'm sure I can pronounce all of them. I have to have it. My pronunciation, I'm not going to worry about it. Some of these organisms remove iridium from solution in a matter of a few hours. They take it out of the solution and put, put it into the plant. Others take a few days, uh, from three to six days. That's pretty quick. And so these organisms gonna, gonna take in the iridium and store it in the plant. All of these time intervals, whether they be a few hours or just a few days, three, three to six days, depending on what organism you have, all of these time intervals would allow for the concentration of iridium during the flood by these organisms if the iridium came from either volcanic emissions or meteorites. And, and again, we have no evidence of any volcanoes that would disperse it because explosive volcanoes, they have no evidence of any that have done that. In there. Hardy and Vanderveu link the cyanobacteria frutexides with the iridium anomalies. And they link it with it, they see some linkage with it. I have no problem, it'll fit my model if these if these uh, bacteria can will concentrate the iridium. Early at Vanderbilt claimed to have found evidence of five magnetic field reversals in the, in the sediment. Now again, our situation is the model that I have would have field reversals due to the interaction of the magnetic fields of mercury and the Earth. Remember, mercury has a significant magnetic field, and of course, uh, they, there are theories about magnetic fields. It shouldn't, if, uh, if it's four billion years old, mercury is, it should not have a magnetic field. So they have evidence of five magnetic field reversal. We've talked about magnetic field reversal. We'll go back through them again. The five polarity reversal in the protexides, protexides bed occur over a stratigraphic interval of 14.5 centimeters. <clears throat> now, for those in the United States, uh, one inch is 2.54 centimeters, about two and a half centimeters to an inch. If this layer was deposited at the rate of 0.6 millimeters per Ka, that's per thousand years, six tenths of a millimeter, and uh, uh, for a thousand years, then the interval represents about 250,000 years, Ka, for the hurley. Again, they're, they are uniformitarian geologists, old Earth, at, at the very best, old Earth creation is probably, if, probably atheists or, or agnostics. The rate of sedimentation is ridiculously small. Six tenths of a millimeter for a thousand years of sedimentation, that's ridiculous. It just doesn't happen that slowly. This amounts to an average of 0 0.0236 inches per thousand years of sedimentation being deposited. And that just doesn't happen that slowly. <clears throat> Obviously, this was deposited during the flood. And the apparent magnetic field reversal made by the planet Mercury as it passed the Earth. That's my, that's my explanation. Ulcer. And they all link of the iridium anomaly at the Permian Jurassic boundary with organic sources. They claim there's an anomaly there at that boundary as well. And so they claim there's one there. Again, <clears throat> this fits my flood model because I believe that there was a, a cosmic activity going on during the flood and pieces of the rings of, of the planet Mercury. And the plan to cause the flood on, on my conclusion is Mercury. That it, the rings of it would have iridium in them. And they state here, Holzer had all the accumulation of metals may have been aided by algae, whose presence is suggested in the laminar textures seen in the interval. So they, they see the evidence of this algae. And there's no problem if this was coming down during the flood <coughs> with the with the rings of the planet Mercury, uh, then it would have had the uh, iridium in it. And the algae could have, in just a few days' time, could have collected. Some of, some of the algae in just a few hours' time would collect it and concentrate. 
We linked this anomaly with volcanic activity and the regression of the sea level. And of course, we have this problem of the regression of sea levels. Uh, we've already been through that. The continents are floating. And the only thing that would make them go down and the seas come over them is if the sea level rose, for example, uh, and it covered the land, or if the flat, if the uh, there was something on the bottom of the continents that was heavy and pulled it down into the magma, and then it would rise back up. So that heavy stuff had to be taken off. And there's no evidence that the cratons, uh, like the tooth, uh, tooth on the, the root on a tooth on a human tooth, and the cratons, the roots of the, of the carpets, uh, has been changed over its lifetime. And they don't think there's evidence of it ever having been changed. So the problem is you get into, the, it should have sunk into the magma to let the marine life the fossils get deposited on it, it'll rise back up to have terrestrial fossils, go back down again to get marine, marine fossils. We've been through that before and already discussed that. And it doesn't, it's not rational. Physics. Um, Wallace said I'll link the iridium anomaly to the presence of iridium in seawater into organic matter. Now we have different kinds of we have different kinds of uh, meteorites, and chondritic chondritic elements. This is non chondritic ratios, this is non chondritic uh, meteorites, and our chondritic is more like rocks or sand, uh, sand, sandy rocks. And uh, so the uh, non chondritic ratios, which is what we're looking at, this is the kind of meteorites that would have the iridium in it. And the abundance of elements known to be mobile at low temperatures, therefore, suggests that element anomalies at the paragumus. Uh, stromatolic horizons are not of extraterrestrial origin. That's what he claims here. And uh, Paragumus is iron. In addition to Paragumus crusts that have grown downward from the roofs of cavities are also enriched in precious metals. Such crusts may have been accumulated large quantities of cosmic dust or they in fact derived iridium rich particles. So again, he's saying it's cosmic dust. And this is where it's come from. And this suggests that the platinum metals, because of the iridium in the platinum group elements, it's one of the platinum group elements, have been derived from solutions. So he's claiming this platinum came from cosmic dust and it settled in the dust. And then it was collected in the, in the roofs, like in caves, on the roof of the cave. It was pulled in by these by these uh, plants uh, and what they, they stored it, uh, put it into the plant. So we've already seen if these, or at least some of these anomalies were derived from seawater, it could have easily been deposited during the flood, or they could have been so. These organisms could re remove iridium in a matter of hours or even a few days, the deposits would still be extra terrestrial. It possibly by the way that have happened during the flood. Certainly that would be plausible. The presence of charcoal now. Sky and telescope is not considered to be a scholarly journal, but it, it does have good material in it. Uh, it's uh, they talk about it in December 1988, page 605 issue of the Sky Telescope Journal. A charcoal and soot in the sediments, other sources. Uh, Find it as well. It's possible that this uh, charcoal was deposited after the flood by fires resulting from lightning, volcanoes, or other sources that burned the debris left by the flood. And lightning could have set it on fire in various places. Volcanoes could have, and of course, meteorites coming in are very, very hot. They could have set it off too. The other sources might have been meteorites that were fragments of the planetary rings that started from Mercury and were lost to Mercury during the year of the flood. And of course, these meteorites keep coming back to the Earth even today. They keep coming back. 
they continue to circle the Earth Moon system and pack the Earth and Moon. I, I, I think we still see them coming back. Impacts on, on the Moon of these particles, these meteorites, would cause the small impact craters and supply layer of dust on the Moon. And of course, they what they do is they look at the number of impacts right now and then they project that backwards for uniformitarian assumptions. And of course, we keep coming back to they reject the uniformitarianism, but they make uniformitarian assumptions. And again, they're not consistent. Of course, atheism is not consistent to begin with, but the impacts on the moon would cause impact craters and supply a layer of dust on the moon as well. And making uh, dating by dust or impact craters would be uh, just impossible. Because you can't do it with uniformitarian assumptions. Impacts on the Earth would cause molten rock to strike the Earth and burn the dead the organic debris that covered large sections of the Earth as the water began to assuage or to decrease. Well, to Genesis 8, and God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the Earth and the waters to assuage. Now we've talked about the wind. And we've already had lessons on that, but this occurred at this time. The windows mountains also of the deep, when the heaven were all stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. So again, we see this occurring. Now, understand now, this is 150, so 150 days after the flood began that this windows of heaven stopped when you look in the context, but it only rained 40 days. So this rain here is is a different rain than the rain of the 40 days. In fact, the two different Hebrew words are used. And the waters returned from off the earth and after the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. So the waters didn't decrease until 150 days after the flood began. But if it was caused by rainfall, it would begin to decrease the minute it quit raining. And uh, so the rainfall was a minor contributor to the flood. It contributed, but not major. And the earth rested on the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And so, upon the mountains, it's not saying it's on the top of a mountain or even above mountains, but it's this is an idiom for saying in that range of mountains. I could say I went up into the Rocky Mountains, and that doesn't mean I'm on top of all the Rocky Mountains. I'm just in that region. The waters decreased continually until the 10th month, and 10th month on the first day of the month where the tops of the mountain were seen. So again, we see this, and it's nearly a year later before it comes out of the ark, over a year before Noah exits the ark. What's going on all this time? The waters are decreasing, and uh, it goes down, the water does, but uh, we see this not decreasing for 150 days. Again, my model has the planet causing the, the flood waters to continue for at least 150 days, but then it has to go away and gets, begins to decrease. Lewis has an extensive list of meteorite impacts that cause fires. So he lists them and we have a source. And Donovan admits that the iridium anomaly on the KT mountain is probably extraterrestrial. He claims it's probably extraterrestrial to have some comets or, or meteorites. At present, Donovan says, however, there's still a very large body of data supporting extraterrestrial. That just, I don't mean we're saying extraterrestrial, we see it's outside the planet Earth, is all we're saying. When I talk about extraterrestrial beings and all these crazy ideas about uh, people coming from other places in the universe. Support an extraterrestrial influence on the Cretaceous tertiary mass, mass extinction. So they say there's an extinction of, of living organisms at that time. It's the only extinction that cannot be attributed to earthly causes, according to Donovan. <clears throat> of course, he's a, he's a uniformitarian geologist and no doubt uh, probably an atheist or an agnostic. <clears throat> Dyer. And at all, say in approximately 75 KT boundary locations, worldwide levels of iridium created in the background by factors of 30 to 300 have been demonstrated. Now, what we mean by background is if you had just normal ground soil, there will be a certain amount of iridium in that soil. 
just by nature of going on average of a certain amount of iridium. Well, what he's saying at these boundary locations, that level is 30 times more than you'd expect normally, or you know, up to 300 times more. That's a significant difference in the amount of iridium in that soil. And that's it's significant. Background level iridium is evaluated and we expect to be found the soil without a terrestrial meter. Comments, what you normally know find. Dyer give, and they all give additional reason to think there was a meteorite impact at least on one occasion. So here's what they say the trace element chemistry, not just iridium, including iridium, at some boundary location resembles the chemistry of a chondritic meteorite. And so that's what we see here chondritic meteorite. Petrographic features such as microspheros. So what we have, we have microspheros. This is little spheres. They're not exactly round, but what they do is they indicate something has gotten very hot and melted, and then kind of it a lot of times it'd be more like in a teardrop shape, as something is maybe moving through the air that's hot, or moving through the ground or moving through water, and it cools off. So it won't be exactly perfectly round, and, but it will have these little shapes. And uh, the shapes, I have some pictures of some of them that we'll show later. Shocked quartz, and that would occur due to the impact of, a, of an object. Uh, craters have shocked quartz in, in the sound of the hind are found in, at KT boundaries worldwide, all over the earth. These are found there. These observations support a hypothesis that it's 65 MA, capital MA, that would be 65 million year, million annum, million years ago, a chondritic meteorite collided with Earth. That's what Dyer claims happened. And of course, the dating is wrong, I believe, but uh, the meteorite came. One problem with the impact theory is that living trees don't burn easily. So we got a problem with it. Living trees that don't burn easily. In order to solve this problem, some of these have theorized that the impact killed trees in a large area, and then the fire spread over these dead trees and killed other trees by air pollution. And that's that's their explanation for that, because the green trees are tend not to burn very well. This theory implies that the iridium should have been in the lower layers of the sediment, with certain charcoal being the upper layers without any iridium. Why? Because the iridium is so heavy, it should have settled out pretty quickly through the through, from the atmosphere. If it's set to fires and then they burned. Walbach et al. and others graphed the iridium in the boundary clay and determined that here's a quote from them. Soot accompanied iridium even in the first fallout fraction. So the soot was there with the iridium at the very beginning. And it didn't come later, it came with it. Both rise more than 200 fold in the bottom 0.3 centimeters of boundary clay and then decline. Apparently, the fire started well before all the ejecta had settled. So it, the fire started very quickly. That's, that's the conclusion. That uh, won't fit their model, but it'll fit my model that we had all this dead wood, trees that had been killed, that had been moved around by the floodwaters, and then they wind up on the dry land. They dry out, and this this uh, meteorite material, hot meteorite material, hits them and sets them on fire. Cohen states, unlike sun and smoke, which probably wa washed out of the lower atmosphere in six months, say, if the sun and smoke washed out of the atmosphere in six months, it's evidence that the bottom 0.3 centimeters of the boundary clay was laid in less than six months. Because it all had soot and, clay and uh, smoke in it. Right. The impact theory requires that the boundary rocks contain shock generated rocks. Right. Now, these rocks are absent in some of the boundaries which contain iridium, but are present in other boundaries. For instance, the KT boundary has these rocks, but other boundaries don't have it. Now, how would you explain that? If the earth was covered with water 
and the, and the iridium came in and it would settle in the rock, into the water. It wouldn't, it wouldn't cause uh, shock generated rocks to occur. Because there would be water there and the water would absorb it and keep it from generating shock generated rocks. And subsequently, it has been found that greatly enhanced level of iridium are associated with the plume from present day eruptions of the Kilauea volcano and that shock. Minerals are associated with volcanic eruptions. Officer Drake said, well, Kilauea has, it has uh, iridium in it. And it has uh, shock generated minerals associated. But you see, it, it's a localized volcano. It does over the Earth. So that's, that's a problem for it. There's evidence of fires. Here's my summary now. We'll continue this next week. Virtually worldwide at some time. Evidence exists, the strongest evidence that these fires were caused by extraterrestrial sources, are probably meteorites. This fits the Fox flood model, with this being the remnants of the rings of mercury and, and or debris from the impacts of both the moon and the mercury during the flood. <coughs> the iridium that doesn't have shocked rocks with it, it was laid and came in and hit the water and settled in the water. And so it didn't create shock rocks. And the, the KT battery was after the flood, and it has the shock rocks in it. That's my explanation for it. Are there any questions? <laughs>